All right, guys, thank, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Ben. Uh, I don't really remember all of his biographic details. Maybe Piotr can help me out with that, but... Uh, he's very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, he's very good. So he, so he did his PhD in uh, MIT. Right now he's in Berkeley. Uh, and he did a lot of good stuff in machine learning. So I, I think uh, what most people remember him for, at least this is, this is how I know his name, is, is, is from that uh, uh, random feature decomposition of kernels, uh, which, was, uh, which is a great paper at... Uh, so, so it was one of those papers that, you know, once you read it, it's all trivial and it's beautiful. This is, this is the best kind of stuff, I think. Uh, and uh, so, so there was such a great paper that, that he actually got an award for it 10 years after it was published, uh, which, uh, which made him well known as, uh, as one of the main adversaries of all these people doing sloppy deep learning and that kind of stuff. Uh, so I guess uh, now recently he's well known for complaining about uh, things, but also doing Things right, and I guess, uh, and I guess uh, this is this is what he's going to tell us about today uh, for control. Okay, so please. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's that's. Um, yeah, that's an interesting. I don't really want to complain today, but I guess that you know there will be some complaining. But I do think there is kind of be a positive way forward, and I, I actually think I'd like to start with a bit of a optimistic note. So first of all, optimistic, optimistic about my collaborators here. This uh, all, everything today is joint work with. Um, my four graduate students and uh, postdoc, um, and would not have been possible without them. Really, uh, really wonderful team. Um, and yeah, on the optimistic note, right? I think like what's cr great about machine learning, I mean, it's kind of an amazing thing. I've been working in this area for, uh, I'm not even gonna mention the number, it's not that long, uh, but, but long enough to know that we've kind of gone from um, basically not, you know, just being kind of a, a little bit of a uh, pipe dream for the future to powering everybody's spam filter to the next thing you know, powering every part of the tech sector. It's kind of amazing to see now machine learning is just out in every possible system you could ever imagine. And that happened very, very quickly. And we started to push machine learning now into things that face people, right? We're really trying to push machine learning into systems that interact with the world and especially systems that interact with humans. And so we had great success in games, and we want to actually move from games into things that where, where these systems are now interacting uh, in much more complex and dynamic environments. Now, as soon as you start to do that, you really have to start thinking about how do we actually make the machine learning reliable and trustable and safe, right? We, we don't want to put machine learning into a car if we don't really trust that it's going to perform well most of the time. Uh, we really, as soon as human lives are at stake, we have to start thinking much more carefully and much more seriously about the kinds of systems we build. So I want to talk a little bit today about how we can build, or how we might be able to, I'm not going to make promises, but how might we be able to build machine learning systems um, which interact with the physical environment and interact with uh, people and make them trustable and predictable. So the research challenge that my group has kind of uh, um, catalyzed around over the last couple of years is trying to understand just, just what are the limits of machine learning that interacts with the world? How do things change as um, you have kind of complex dynamic environments that start to kind of interface with your machine learning systems? And maybe the simplest question to start off with is just how well do I have to actually understand a system in order to make it do something that I'd like? So if I have a, a, a system that can collect data, or, or sorry, I have a system from which I can collect data, how much do I actually have to under collect? How much do I have to gather in order to actually make it do something? Uh, and the, the way we do that is we call it control. It does actually sound a little bit um, authoritarian, we, but we want to actually make, we want to think about this less in the authoritarian sense for now, although I will loop back into that at the end. I promise um, I, I, we had a little conversation beforehand as I'm from Berkeley, so I will promise some communist rhetoric at the, at the end of the talk. So, <laughs> uh, but until then, let's, what's cool about this is there are lots of, I mean, if you're a theory person, there's a lot of cool stuff to do in this space. If you're not a theory person, I do think the theory people might actually have some value to add in this space. And, that actually, um, and I, I kind of want to describe a little bit about why the current machine learning method, mindset of let's just do something and ship it which is also the computer science mindset, has its shortcomings. And you know there is a place for actually trying to have some, uh, I, I, I believe, <laughs> theorists in the room when we try to uh, push some of these things out into the world. 
you don't have to agree with me, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to try to make a case. <clears throat> All right, so what's control theory? It sounds scary, but it's actually just the study of dynamical systems with inputs. Okay, so we have a system here, which I'm going to mark in a box by G. So it's kind of just something where I can turn one of the knobs, I can like bang on that system. The bang on the system means I could feed in an input U, and then I can measure an output. The simplest kind of dynamical system is where all of those variables, the inputs, the outputs, and the internal states are related by linear, matri uh, linear transformations. Okay, so here we have just a system of uh, equations. The next state is equal to some linear map of the current state plus whatever the input is, and the output is the current state times uh, uh, some function of the current state and also the, the, the input. Okay. And so what is state? State is really what do I have to know about this box? <laughs> in order to predict the future. It's the, it's the totality of what I need to know in order to predict the future. And that's just, so this says that uh, there is some state for which, there is some vector x for which all predictions about the future uh, are, are governed by a li uh, this linear map. <clears throat> so xt is the state. For me, the dimension will always be d. The input will always be dimension p. And I'll, I'll remind you of that just because it's easy to rotate this thing to that thing. I, don't, I couldn't figure, there are just too many letters in the talk, so I was just going to go with rotations. And so like if we, we're not going to have outputs, but if I were, I could just make it Q. Again, just doing symmetries of the D. <laughs> Instead of having D1, D2, D3, that's what we went for. Anyway, mostly today we're going to talk about X and U. So that's what we really want to talk about. And we want to understand things that like, uh, we want to understand um, complexities in terms of how, do, how, how does the complexity of making this thing work scale with respect to dimension and scale with respect to the dimension of the input? So many folks in here have heard of reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is actually like control. They're very much the same kind of idea. They just operate on different spaces. Reinforcement learning likes to act on discrete spaces. It comes from a computer science mindset. And in this case, kind of like the primitive object or the simplest object is what's called a partially observed Markov decision process. Um, and so we, and typically they're probabilistic models that the current state will induces a probability on future states. Okay. So if you know P POMDPs, you know everything you need to know about linear systems as well. And now everything is just a discrete value. So we're, I, I, I come from the continuous side of things and many of the actions we want to do in cars and in robotics end up actually being with continuous action spaces. So it is easier to think that way. But everything has a nice mapping. Everything's isomorphic back and forth. Okay, so what is control design? Control design is actually I want to build a different dynamical system. And this one is going to take the outputs of the, of the system I want to control, do some computation, and then spit out an input for the system. And usually this is to, do, to achieve some objective. I'm going to have a concrete example in a minute. Actually, a couple concrete examples that are very easy. But this is kind of the abstract setup. It's really just I, take two, I, I have a dynamical system, and I want to design another one to make G do something. Optimal control will mean, when I say do something, it will be solve an optimization problem, whatever that means. And actually, the, the controller design is actually a very well studied and kind of classic problem, and in a lot of ways is solved. I apologize to any control theorists who might be in the room. I think it's actually, it's so successfully solved that we don't even think about it, yet every single thing in this room, in one way or another, is powered with a control system. So it kind of underlies the fabric of our current modern society. It's like all of these little controllers doing all sorts of amazing things. But something that's hard, and that's not well understood, is what happens when this thing that we're trying to control is a black box. And I don't know anything about it, but I'd like to make it do something. This is again the how well do I have to understand a system in order to control it. And so now I have some black box, I have a controller, and I'd like to make it do something. And this, if you are a reinforcement learning researcher, should feel very similar. This is kind of what is the classic thing in reinforcement learning. We have to excite the system, we have to explore what happens, and then do, make decisions based on that. And so a major challenge that is very well, not well settled at all, is how well can we perform control when the system is unknown? And how much information do we have to gather in order to do well? So let me give you now a very concrete example. This is a picture of a data center from Google, and this is their cooling apparatus. And one of the big challenges in running one of these big data centers is you have you know, thousands of machines, 
Uh, people have a lot of queries that they have to search for and videos to serve on YouTube with crazy conspiracy theories. So to keep the conspiracy theories running, uh, you need to cool the machines. See, there you go, there's a common one. There, <laughs> you can throw those in there. Uh, so, right, so how do you cool the machines? Essentially, it's, uh, honestly, it's actually kind of a, uh, it's an amazingly boring problem. You know, you have giant fans at the end of each of these corridors and they blow cold air onto the machines. And if it wasn't data center cooling, this would be called heating, uh, uh, well, well, HVAC, you know, it's air conditioning. I mean, it's like really like, it sounds a lot less exciting if you call it air conditioning than if you call it data center cooling, but so be it. So be it. So be, I, I can't get a deep mind press release out of uh, uh, air conditioning. Um, now, how would you solve it? Okay, so one, one thing, I actually, people have told me this, and it's, there, I would not do it this way is to build a finite element model of the data center. That seems like overkill, okay? Build some crazy differential equation model of the whole thing. What people actually do for air conditioning is you build a lump model. So you have sources that produce heat, you have sources that can shed heat, you have ways of actually doing heat transfer, and from these equations, you, um, you know, very simple equations that you might learn in a uh, junior level course uh, in an engineering program, you can actually set up a very simple model that actually allows you to understand how cooling would work. <clears throat> and then there maybe is the machine learning approach, which is I look at the sensors, I look at the actions that I've taken, I collect a lot of data, and I fit a neural network to it. And which of these is the right thing to do? I, I don't know. But how do we put these on the right, same footing? I don't know what's right, but how do we put these on the same footing? I think, and that's actually the interesting question to me. Right? So there's the identify everything approach, there, which actually does have its place, not in air conditioning, but in, if you're building a high performance aircraft or some other kind of vehicle that really has to do super high performance, models are critical. For things where the time scales are somewhat slow and it's not really as important to be um, um, acting very quickly, you just wanna be safe and you wanna make sure that your server doesn't catch on fire, uh, maybe you could do something else. And these are the, the two main paradigms of this kind of course modeling are called model predictive control and PID control. I'll talk a little bit about the second one. Um, and then there's the, the kind of cavalier machine learning approach where we don't need models. And this is kind of, in some sense, this is like where people are currently pushing in reinforcement learning. And certainly this is what you push in online learning, which is a complete absence of knowledge. Um, and now the question is like, which is the right thing to do? Um, so how, how do we actually distinguish what the baseline is for these, for these problems? Okay, I, I, let's take a step that way. We're gonna take a step that way today. I don't, I don't have a clear answer yet, but again, I think that itself is a good research question. How do we actually distinguish what is, what is actually necessary in order to do these kind of, uh, uh, to, to have this kind of performance? So I have this thing about PID control. I just wanna take a, a, a second to talk about it. Computer scientists never learn it. And actually a lot of times even electrical engineers don't learn it enough. PID control is amazing. And it powers, it, uh, I got this number from Carl Astrom, who is one of the gods of PID control. And Carl told me that uh, they've done multiple surveys and within the last 10 years, 95% of the control systems that are in existence, the one that, that actually uh, you know, regulate the electricity in, in our devices, the ones that do um, maintain power, the ones that heat our espresso machines, all of the ones that are out there that are important for our everyday existence, 95% of them use not just PID control, but what's called PI control. Two parameters. There's a parameter P, there's a parameter I. What are these? I have some kind of target that I'd like to achieve, like keep my espresso machine at 96 degrees Celsius. That's very important. <laughs> so, and in order to do that, you look at how far off the current temperature is from where you want it to be. Um, take the difference, this is my error, and I will, my control will be proportional to the error that's P, and maybe plus the integral of the error, which is I. And if you really want to be fancy, you can add in the derivative of the error, and that's D. Three things, almost no models. There is modeling to understand how this works, but it's kind of amazing, two parameters. Suffice to control 95% of the things that we ever interact with. And so the question is for the more advanced things, the things that can't be done with simple PID control, how much do we have to know? And the answer is maybe not that much, and this is what I'd like to try to get at. Okay, so let's do optimal control. Again, so we'll look a couple more formulas, and that's, this, this, 
I'm going to make this less abstract in one second. Let's make this less abstract. Optimal control looks like reinforcement learning though. If you've ever seen reinforcement learning, we call it, for me, I like to minimize costs because I'm an optimization person. We minimize stuff. Um, but for whatever reason in, uh, I think it's because computer scientists are so optimistic, they maximize reward. So, <laughs> or maybe it's because they hang out with the econ folks. One of the way, either way, either way. So it's either optimism or greed. I'm not sure which one we're dealing with. <laughs> Let's go with it. Well, well, huh? I know, I know, I know. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. It doesn't matter. Optimization people maximize too. It's all the same stuff. You just flip it over. It's fine. I don't care. Everything's symmetric. Is the glass half full or is it half empty? I don't know. Anyway, so, but either way, this is the same thing. And we have some cost and it changes over time. And it's a function of the current state and the current input. And then we have some box that takes the state and the input and some disturbance and gives us the new state. And that's kind of the model of the system. So ET would be noise. We can all FT, if you guys care about this, a state transition function. But it's just, that's the black box that feeds things forward. And we want to say, given that black box that's kind of constantly changing our dynamical system, moving things forward in time, how do I actually minimize the cost? So let's make this concrete. Here's my concrete example. It's a super silly toy. It's not real, but it's, I think, very, very illustrative. So I have a, a drone. I want to move the drone over to here. I have propellers. Actually, it's better if I just do up and down, because lateral is actually a little harder on these things. Up and down is very easy because then all I have to do is spin the propeller faster and it goes up. You spin them a little less fast and it goes down. And that obeys Newton's laws. Hopefully everybody's seen. Newton's laws are you know, position, z, is just equal to position plus some multiple of the velocity. Velocity is equal to some position, multiple, the velocity plus some multiple of the acceleration. Acceleration times mass is equal to force. And these are all, you know, we figured these out uh, 400 years ago, <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> this is good stuff. And then we can also introduce something new, which people don't typically talk about. It's called jerk, and that's the derivative of acceleration. I'll tell, I'll tell you why we have jerk in a second, but that's, you know. And I could define the derivative of jerk. I don't remember what that's called. And then I could just pose an optimization problem, because I'm an optimization person. So I could minimize an indicator function, which counts one if I'm not in my target, and then I get zero if I actually get to the target. Maybe, I don't, I'm just making something up. I'm doing some cost design. And then I have Newton's laws, which are just multiplying a matrix times the state, right? These are all linear. And the input is just one over m times u. That gives me the acceleration. So everything's nice and linear. So I have a linear equation. I, the state x is just the concatenation of all of these variables. <coughs> so I have linear constraints, which I like, and some cost that looks a little nasty. So as an optimizer, what I'll do is I'll say, OK, that cost doesn't look that fun. What I'm going to do is instead approximate it with a quadratic. Why not? <laughs> I could do something else. Uh, and then once I've, once I've decided to model things with quadratics, at least I can see how this works. At least I can start to analyze things. I can start to make it more complicated. I can say, I want to penalize myself for using too much battery. So now I'm penalizing the force. Don't use too much battery. I could also penalize jerk. Jerk basically makes it house stable, because if you make a very unstable motion, you can start to break your device. So I can penalize the jerk as well. Now I have this nice quadratic cost and linear constraints, and you could just solve that now. Um, and if you're clever, you would solve it by dynamic programming, but if you're not clever, you feed it into um, TensorFlow, and that will also work. So whatever you'd like to do, it will also work. Very easy. So this is a special case, which is good enough for kind of like this mechanical motion, and it's good enough for a lot of different applications, and it's called the linear quadratic regulator. LQR, linear quadratic regulator. Um, so here's the abstract version where I want to minimize the cost at every time step is a quadratic function of the state and the control, and the dynamics are linear dynamical systems, which is what I've been talking about. And for me, this is a nice baseline. This is a step beyond PID control, so just one step beyond. It's very easy to state, and the question is how well can I do this if I don't know the dynamics? I don't know how the dynamical system evolves, I just know it obeys these laws. So how well can this work? And what do I have to do to actually make that happen? And so for me, this is an application of what I like to call the linearization principle. And this is kind of the way I do machine learning research now. This is, this is, this is, this is my now prime directive. I think we can move beyond this. 
I just always feel like, uh, in some sense, in machine learning, we've gotten too excited and we move to too complicated things too quickly before we just look at the simple case. And so it's just basically a reduction to, does this pass the sniff check? So if you have a machine learning algorithm that you propose to me, and I run it on something simple, like a linear model, and it does something crazy, then my guess is it doesn't actually work as well as you think it does for the hard problem. There's probably something that's going on for the hard problem. It's just like if I'm a computer scientist, someone tells me they solve SAT, and hence P is equal to NP. I'm like, here, let's try this two-sat instance first and see what happens. Right? And if it can't solve the two-sat instance for some reason, but it can only solve three-sat, something is wrong. Something is wrong. Two-sat, just in case you forgot, that one's this one we can solve in polynomial time. So, and this has actually been something that my group has been kind of pushing on, and I've also been working with uh, another, another fan of the linearization principle, it's more its heart. And so we've kind of been looked at this in terms of recurrent neural networks. It's actually helped us understand a little bit more about uh, the weird, you know, the emergence of margin in neural networks. Um, you can use this, we have a paper at NIPS this last year where we kind of use this to analyze this atom algorithm and found some peculiarities there. So it's very, very kind of, this has been like a driving force for us. And so let's go back to LQR and see what happens here. Let's use something. So if I don't know A and B, or sorry, if I do know A and B, if I know A and B, it's a simple problem. It's actually, this, there's a beautiful solution. There's a beautiful solution. And it's that the optimal um, control is a linear function of the state, and that control does not depend on time. This is a beautiful classic thing. I don't remember who figured this out. We attribute the, the thing you have to solve is attributed to Riccati. So I <laughs> imagine he must have been the guy who did it. But really simple. You just solve, and you can solve a simple, um, well, it's not that simple. You have to solve a somewhat complicated system of uh, nonlinear equations to find this, but it's actually very easy to derive this. Okay. Um, now, what happens if I don't know it? A and B. So something obvious would be jiggle the system a little bit, just shake it a little bit, estimate what the state transition matrix is, and then design control as if that was true. Okay. We call that nominal control. I call it nominal control. I should put that on this slide. Um, it's, it's nominal for the, like it's, it's a model in name only, because it's not actually the real one. Um, the question is, is that optimal? Or is it close to optimal? Or does it, is it fragile? And um, how many samples do I need before I know that this is good? Okay, so let's, let's see if we can answer two of these. So before I do that, I want to kind of just take a mild digression before looking at nominal control and go to, let's say, let, let me now pretend I'm, I'm going to fake my way through being a uh, reinforcement learning researcher. I, I'm not good at this. So, you know, Gurgay, don't get too mad here. <laughs> this is not good. So what I'm going to do is the following. Okay, here, here is kind of like a like an exploration exploitation approach to trying to solve this problem, where it's like I'm not even going to try to build a model, or, or like the, I'm not going to try to fit a model. I'm going to try to just use the fact that I know it's there. And so what I would do is say, well, look, I know that if I knew the model, the greedy strategy would, or the the optimal strategy would be to find a fixed gain, um, k, just to find that k. And so what I'm going to do is take a current k and then like try it. But I'm going to add a little bit of exploration noise to kind of fuzz out the space to see, you know, just to see if I could have done better by changing things. Then I'll compute the cost of my kind of like new exploration you know, around the current model, see if I can get an improvement. And then I'm going to do this update where I'm going to take the current cost and then multiply it by uh, this sum of new t times xt star. So I, does anybody know where I got that formula from? Only people who read my blog maybe. <laughs> so it turns out that's not epsilon greedy. So I was, I was lying. It's not actually epsilon greedy. Because epsilon greedy has a, you know, there's a different algorithm you would do. It just kind of seems like a reasonable thing to do until I get to that last line. It turns out that last line is something called policy gradient. Okay, and this is actually the policy gradient algorithm for LQR. Um, there are a couple of things that are funny. If people have heard of policy gradient, well, even if you haven't, it has the word gradient in the title. But we're accessing everything through function evaluations. There are no gradients here. So we're giving ourselves a little bit of false hope. We're really just doing derivative free optimization, black box search. But we, we dress it up in some funny language. I think that's very important. Take, take that away. If anybody tells you about policy gradient, it's not doing, there's no gradients. It's just a fancy name for something that's trying to do black box search. And black box search has some issues. So while people tell us that policy gradient or trust region policy optimization can solve bipedal walking, I don't consider those solutions that I'm showing here solved. 
I don't know what the heck is happening there. It's just we have some sim simulations. If anybody hasn't seen this, there are a set of benchmarks released by this company called OpenAI, which is funded by uh, crazy old Elon Musk. And uh, <laughs> anyway, there's some issues here. I don't consider this solved at anything. And also, it's, like, it's in a simulator. If you put this on an actual robot, bad things happen. Um, they never actually work. And so like, there are lots of issues here. It's like the, the, the assuming that I could just plug in the static K, that's not convex. Um, policy gradient has really bad variants. Let me, let me not dwell too much here. I think there is, there's something weird here though. It's like I, I, I'm kind of making this absurd claim that like that simple algorithm looks a little weird and it does seem like it's giving us weird solutions and doesn't seem like it works that well. I should have actually thrown in a plot I can link to my blog. It doesn't actually work that well on LQR. It's actually really bad. It's worse than just kind of like random guessing a lot of the times. And the question is, how could that be true? And so it's like one of these things where you're saying like there are all these people, you know, you have billionaires, brilliant billionaires and, and capitalists like Musk inventing, investing all this money and you have brilliant companies like Google investing all this money in this kind of research. How could they be wrong? And so, so most people attribute this quote to Carl Sagan, but lots of people have misused this quote to kind of bully people. In particular, this guy uh, said this at a press conference. Everybody, does anyone recognize this, him anymore? No? It's Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong. He actually said that at a press conference that, like, how could I be doping? <laughs> this is, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. But unfortunately, that's only true if your prior is actually correct. And if you had been misled, it's actually, you know, maybe, maybe, the, maybe we're just misled by a lot of the kind of outrageous claims. And in fact, I think we could actually see this by looking at the own words of the people doing this kind of crazy reinforcement learning. No, it's not called crazy, but very audacious reinforcement learning. So let me just read you two quotes from the OpenAI folks themselves. This is like from their blog. Reinforcement learning results are tricky to reproduce. Performance is very noisy. Algorithms have many moving parts, which allow for subtle bugs, and many papers don't report all the required tricks. Reinforcement learning algorithms are challenging to implement correctly. Good results typically only come after fixing many seemingly trivial bugs. I don't want that in my car. That's just me. That's just me. I feel like there should be something, uh, there should be a better way here. More troubling is if you look at some other researchers, a great team from McGill did some studies where they actually tried to look at stability results for these, these models. And they started to look at these kind of simulations of walking. And they would see that if you just pick two sets of random seats, that you don't even get overlap in the error bars between the random seats in the run. So somehow you could... No. I have some problems with this figure. Well, let me give you another figure in like one slide. That will be, I think, more, more convincing, that there's something weird going on here. Um, this, this figure, actually, I like this is even better. This, is, this figure is three implementations of the same algorithm. All three of the papers that are cited here have the same co-author. Shulman is actually a co-author in all three of these papers, and they ran them and they get three different curves for like the performance over time. That's troubling too. It's the same algorithm, just three different implementations. That's funny. That's probably more troubling. <laughs> so the question is, is there a better way? So the answer is actually there is like, even for these kind of weird problems, which are not quadratic, right? I mean, we kind of, we, if we tr apply them to the quadratic problem, it does something weird. If we apply them now to the non-quadratic problem, what happens? Um, we, could, we could actually come up with a, a simpler search heuristic and see how that works. And that search heuristic would just be, uh, I'm just going to perturb the current model by some delta and see if that current perturbation makes my life better. This is much more, if, if you use SciPy Optimize, it's basically what SciPy Optimize does. It's called the, this is a crummy version of what's called the Nelder Mead method, which goes back to like the 60s. I mean, it's like a really dumb search. We just kind of perturb our current policy and try to roll ourselves downhill and then do the exact same thing where we just, if that's good, we kind of take a step along that direction. It turns out that this, which is just pure random search, this column is pure random search, and these, these are the rewards achieved by different algorithms. These are different reinforcement learning algorithms. This is pure random search uh, with linear controllers, no neural nets. There are no neural nets. It's just linear controllers and pure random search either meets or dramatically outperforms all of this kind of neural net stuff with fancy widgets. And that's also troubling. And what I also don't like is I don't even think this, just because it outperforms it doesn't mean it's good. This, so these guys, like if we look at, this is a humanoid. These numbers are all about 6,000, right? This is 6,000. This is, we found, it, we found a good example of 6,000. So first of all, it's hopping. 
which is not walking. So the reward is already messed up. And second of all, there's no way that actually would work. That hop, I've tried it. You fall, humans fall over if you actually try to hop that way. What's worse is like this, this one is the top performing one. <laughs> also, I'm pretty sure it will not work on an actual robot. So I don't know what's going on there. So there's something, there's something funny about the fact that all we're doing is overfitting to a simulator. What I'm not mentioning here is that this requires, each of these require at least 100,000 simulations before you get to these numbers, which you also never get a chance in the real world to run something 100,000 times, e even if it's in the lab. And you certainly don't get a chance when you're out in your car. So there, there probably still has to be a better way. And then this is now back to Gergay's point. This, this is actually with random search, because random search is so much simpler, we can actually try it rather than over five or 10 random seeds. We can do 100 random seeds. And where's the humanoid? The humanoid is down here. The legend kind of is cropping things here. But what we see is that 30, like roughly 30% of the time, it just isn't even working. Even though we're getting the highest reward possible some of the time over here, this is like the highest thing that they can get. A lot of times you take those same parameters and it just doesn't work. So we're in this weird state where maybe just blindly kind of trying to explore and, and, and get an answer without actually building a model might be tricky. And the question is, is there a better way than trying to actually fit that dynamical model, you know, than trying to just purely get a policy? for these control problems. So let me suggest the answer is maybe. And let me suggest something that kind of gives us a partial way forward with what we've been doing. All right, so we draw, this is what we've been doing in our group. This is like the classical approach. First of all, if you've ever taken a controls course, we always draw block, block diagrams like this, and then almost everybody stops paying attention to you. It's like some weird, but it's actually really simple, right? This is the thing we want to control. This is the controller. This is the signal flow. Output goes into this guy, and then this guy makes a new input. So here is something which is what we call course ID control. The idea is what we're, we're gonna do is use a little bit of data to fit a model. And it's not the exact model, it's an approximate model. We know it's just gonna be some nominal model. But the biggest difference, and actually I think the, th the thing that we're gonna really bring to bear more than the control theory folks did, and this is purely just because we have folks like, uh, you know, like Gabor who have been building amazing tools in high dimensional statistics for, for decades, that stuff has come to fruition. Now we can revisit 20-year-old results in control. We can actually estimate how good this model is. We know we, know we can, with high probability, not only that, I, that, you know, that this estimate is, true to, is close to the truth. And so I can estimate how good this is. Now, now what I have is a disturbance, which is just my statistical uncertainty. So for control theory people, this would be called robust control. But actually estimating the error is actually the hard part in robust control. But we actually have tools to do that now. And we actually have tools that do this provably and reliably. It's very nice, using high dimensional statistics. And then we could do what's called robust control. But even there, we're, uh, I'm not going to talk about it today. We actually need a few extra widgets to make this kind of work. But I will be happy to talk about that offline. So this is the course idea idea. You first fit a course model. You estimate your uncertainty. And once you've estimated your uncertainty, then you do robust optimization to build the controller. This is not what I said before, which is this nominal idea, which is just fit this model and treat it as true. It's take the uncertainty into account when we actually build the control. Let me give you, a, a, yeah, I could do this just for this, this. This is the only part where I actually go and do some math. Two slides of math. Just stick with me if you don't care. You could just, I'll, I'll tell you when to come back. But for my friends, <laughs> this is, this, I'm going to do one step of LQR, so no time. But it actually, the argument is basically what we're going to do in one step. Just now, you have, it's more complicated, obviously. A lot more bookkeeping when you have multiple steps. It's just the following. What we do, here's one step of LQR. So there's no time. So I just have an unknown B matrix. Okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to do some experiments. And then just fit least squares. Okay, very exciting. <laughs> What's cool about that, though, right, is that not only gives me an estimate, but then with high probability, I can bound the operator norm difference between the truth and the, and the error. Okay, that's cool. And then we do, this is really dumb. I know this, this is just true. It's just that whatever that estimate is, uh, the, the true B would be B hat plus delta B. And so this equation is definitely true for what the state should be. It should be B times the control plus delta B times the control plus this initial state. That's kind of dumb. But that means I can now push the uncertainty out of the constraint and into the cost. 
So this is completely equivalent. So what I have now is just a constraint that uses the nominal model, and then I'm going to maximize over the worst case disturbance, and that's all in the cost. Okay. And so for this problem, I could do something really stupid and just do the triangle inequality, take, take this cost and just do the triangle inequality. I mean, this is dumb. I, we do something a little bit more sophisticated in the paper, in the paper but I just let me just show you my amazing realization here. But the important thing is that once I've done that, I can actually get a generalization bound. An end-to-end -end generalization bound, not just about the, the error in the model, but now the error in the control. And the reason why is just because I know that the, um, the true thing will be feasible for this, and that allows me to just get the chain of inequalities right. So I can get actually, if I know how bad my model is, I can now pr propagate that and know how bad the control will be. And this actually lets us do this for LQR. So for LQR, the obvious strategy I said was to build this, now come back everybody, <laughs> if you were listening there. So the obvious strategy was to build a, a approximate model and then build the control based on that. What we do instead is we build the approximate model, which is here, but we account for the uncertainty. And we push that, and I don't, I'm not showing the calculation here, we do the exact same thing that we did before uh, pushing that into the cost. And what that lets us get, this is messy, and this might only be for my friends, but like still, what we get is an end-to-end -end bound on what the relative error is. We get an end-to-end -end bound, and it decreases as with the horizon length, basically the number of samples we take, as a linear dependence on the parameters, the, the size of the dimension of the state, the size of the dimension of the input. And then it has some instance-specific constants out front, which you, I'll tell, I can tell anybody who cares later, but they're actually really interesting. Essentially what this, with the, don't, you don't, don't worry, I'm putting them up here because they're a formula, but I can just tell you in words what they say. They say that a system that where if I apply an input and it gets excited and it moves a lot, those are easier to estimate and hence that reduces my complexity for control. On the other hand, if I had, let's just say that somebody had handed me the optimal control, like I knew the model and designed the optimal control. If that is very sensitive to perturbations, that actually means that I'm also very sensitive to modeling error. And these things are just captured in these terms. So it's really kind of capturing stuff about the system that are, are quite relevant for actual performance. Um, and what is also cute is that this tells you when the cost is finite. And that to me, this doesn't, maybe it's hard to appreciate for folks who haven't worked in controls before, but the LQR problem is working on an infinite time horizon. We really care about what's happening on really, really long time scales. And what this is saying is with a finite amount of data, if the model is true, I can tell you whether or not we're actually going to have something that would work forever, that won't cause a catastrophic fire in my data center, for example. Which is pretty, which is very neat. But let's talk about data centers. Maybe, <laughs> why not? Why, why robust? Why do I actually need this kind of robust uncertainty and not the nominal model? So we haven't been able to show that this obvious strategy is bad. But I can demonstrate to you now an example where, the, where that strategy will fail, whereas the robust strategy will work. And so this is my very silly toy model of a data center. Okay, so I have, I have my data center racks. They generate heat. So I put a fan on them to cool them down. And then they will, uh, can transfer heat uh, between each other because they're near each other. And the dynamics look something like this. This is a crude approximation. You'd really want to do something more sophisticated in your data center. But it's, it's Laplacian dynamics, for people who know that. Um, and it's very simple. Uh, and you have your kind of local control with some disturbance. And what's funny here is that the diagonals are all bigger than one. So if I were to run this for a long time without a control signal, it will eventually get really large. The number will get really large. And that's bad. That causes fires. So. The problem now is that if I do estimation, just think about what would happen with least squares. If you, instead of estimating one of these numbers as 1.01, you estimate them as 0.99, and you're very frugal and you don't want to spend money on power, maybe you turn off that fan. But it was actually 1.01. You estimated it as 0.99, but it was actually 1.01. And that can actually lead to some, ca some uh, catastrophic behavior. So if I plot here, just the, the red curve here is the nominal strategy of just treating the estimate as truth. The purple curve here is um, uh, robust LQR where I actually tell it the true error of estimation. The blue is actually where I estimate it using a very conservative bootstrap. I feel, I feel like we should, get, we should use a less conservative bootstrap here, but this is being 
incredibly conservative with the estimate, and it's, you, know, you lose a little bit, but you're still getting uh, stable systems. And this looks a lot worse once I put on the error bars. So now what you're seeing actually is the error bars for the nominal control are huge, but the error bars for the robust uh, LQR are fairly small. And if you look at how often am I actually returning a policy that will net, that's guaranteed to not blow up, so we can actually compute that after the fact, the nominal control, even after about 600 samples, is 10% of the time returning something that will burn the data center. Whereas after about 100 samples, the robust methods are, are fine. Okay, so it's pretty cool. That's actually, that's, that's, so the robustness helps. The robustness helps. Let me just say something mean about reinforcement learning once again. <laughs> so I have a blog about, just I posted yesterday, that I should have actually added the figure here uh, some other time for policy gradient, which again, I don't like. It doesn't fit on this chart. Policy gradient doesn't fit on the chart the way I plotted it here. The green line here is um, policy iteration using temporal differencing. And even that is still off from where it should be. So it might be improvable, but it really does say like, seem like that there is a, a, this is now for my friends who work on reinforcement learning. Sometimes it feels like just task specific policies should be able to beat out things which actually fit a model that works for all cases. And I haven't found a case where that's true yet. It does, at least for the, these continuous problems, it does seem like building a good model goes a lot, a, a, a lot farther than um, the task specific things in the instances I've studied. So we could push on that. Um, I do think there's something weird here. The, the linear thing that was supposed to be easy and supposed to be the sanity check is not simple. And I think this is one of the really challenging things for reinforcement learning and the really challenging things for making these things robust is as soon as you have interactivity, everything becomes hard. And it's easy to do stuff and ship it and really hard to analyze and it drives us theorists crazy. So we gotta be careful. So but this thing that was supposed to be simple, analyzing LQR, ends up with complicated formula everywhere. We end up having to do, you know, we're using crazy new large deviation theory, crazy new stuff from robust control, all just to analyze this really stupid problem. <laughs> Well, it's not stupid. Sorry, I say stupid, but like, you know, okay, we said 95% of things are PI, PI control, and then that remaining 5%, 95% of those are LQR. So, okay, it's not stupid. It's pretty, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a workhorse. And trying to understand what happens with the unknown dynamics is hard. And in particular, right, like these things that are hard to estimate and the control is insensitive to model mismatch, actually, you know, the harder they are to estimate, actually, Sorry, the, the things that are kind of rough and stable are very hard to estimate and hence actually harder to control than we thought. And on the other hand, these things that are kind of like really high performing and hard to control tend to be easy to estimate. So there are these intrinsic kind of trade-offs that we don't fully understand here. And what's particularly weird about this is from the estimation point of view, now I'm gonna say something that like maybe just these guys, <laughs> just for these guys. From the estimation point of view, if you use something which is called a um, uh, blocking argument, for stochastic processes, you get the opposite. You get that it's actually easy to estimate the thing that's very stable and hard to estimate the thing that's very complicated. So there's something fundamentally, there's a, there's a I found 50 pages on Cosmos, 50 papers on a blog by Cosmos Silesi that seem to contradict our result. But it's because they're using an argument that's very coarse. So there's, some, there's still a lot to actually do in learning theory for time series to kind of patch this stuff together. So yeah, why has no one done this before? It's like, I one, the statistics is, is new. like we have come a long way in high dimensional statistics since robust control was last hot. Robust control was really big in the 90s. Like just think about the leaps and bounds we've made in, in understanding uh, large deviation theory since then. So that's why it's kind of we can do new stuff. It turns out that what we actually do for the LQR problem uses semi-definite programming and a, a kind of an amazing new um, approach to control developed by Nick Motney, who was a postdoc with me. And I feel like this is gonna be revolutionary in a lot of different areas of control, so that's also another reason it hasn't been done. And of course, you know, the singularity is now here, so that's the other reason why no one's looked at this before. <laughs> Actually, I guess the one thing I will say is, the one, the one paper I found that really does try to really tackle the LQR problem is by uh, Abbas Yagkori and Shevazvari. Uh, it's a really nice paper from 2011, although there still is an exponential dependence on dimension, which we've shaved down to polynomial. It's a regret bound, um, they can't guarantee that the parameters converge, which is not such a big deal, but the actual running the algorithm requires solving an NP-hard problem at every iteration, which is tough. But
but that was that was the, the it was a good it's a great paper. It actually had a lot of we had a lot of uh, took a lot from that paper. But it's kind of weird that it's like that was one of the only things we could find in kind of the whole space. But hopefully now there's a lot more opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, there's some problems with the power factor. Uh, yeah, but does three dot f means the empty hard space is full. That's true. That's true. <laughs> I was looking at this one. Let, let's talk about that offline, because that also, so hot, I mean, yes, it does get rid of the, the subroutine. Um, but there is, there is something else that they assume that's a little weird in terms of, yeah, okay. anyway. There's a third one. Though. Okay, there's a new one. All right, well, we'll take a look. We'll take a look. So there's plenty of us that, there's plenty of stuff that's left to do here, right? I think that there is something weird here where, uh, Things that use models do seem to perform better than things that don't want to fit the dynamical system models, but the field needs more baselines. And we have to figure out what those baselines are. And I don't feel like that the current paradigm of using video game simulations is enough. We really have to get a feel for, one, baselines for theory people to try to tinker with. But I even think as experimentalists, the field needs to have stuff that's a little bit more accessible for everybody um, and not just nailing three or four benchmarks. Because it's too easy to overfit three or four benchmarks. Um, and so we've been kind of exploring a bunch of different directions, um, kind of following up on this uh, at Berkeley, in particular, you know, moving away from linear models, learning about uncertain environments, trying to move away from this kind of iterative type learning towards real online learning, which is where we'd like to go. Um, and, and we've been working closely with some folks who do autonomous driving to actually start to push some of these ideas actually into test beds, which has been very cool. So, our friend Ole Muskie again. Uh, let me just use the end of this talk to, to, to say, look, there's a lot of hype around AI and a lot of hype around reinforcement learning. I think we have a very, very long way to go. Um, in particular, the bottom one is terrifying. The top one is just funny. There we go. Come on. You know, walking robots don't really work yet. So <laughs> we have a ways to go to deal with actually these problems in the real world. We've all had days like this, but uh, robots are still having days like this all the time. Um, here we go again. Huh? Well, but at the end of the day, if your robot breaks, I mean, you drive 100 miles and then you crash into the back of a car. This guy died, actually. I mean, like, uh, look, this one, this, we've heard about the one in Florida, but we actually have dash cam video from the guy in China who died. I mean, this is something he had his autopilot on. It didn't, because they're in China, there was, it was like one of those smoggy days. It didn't see the thing in front of him and it crashed into something in the side of the road. Yeah. There is a non-zero chip, yeah, drive, okay, well, if we want to make an uh, argument for abolishing cars, I'm fine with it. I think the problem is that if you're a driver and you're negligent, we can put you in jail. If you're Elon Musk and you're negligent, you get to go run around at South by Southwest and nothing happens to you. And that to me is the problem. That to me is the problem. I feel like we do need better, you know, and also, and also, we have, the, like, the fact that this guy thinks that we should be more concerned with nuclear weapons when his cars crash into things. They also think is a little bit odd to me. Um, and I think, look, we can make this work. We can make, I think we, can, we are in an exciting time for machine learning. I'm not quite, I would not say that we've actually reached the point where artificial intelligence is electricity. Um, but artificial intelligence works now in a way that I don't think it has worked for, since its inception. On the other hand, I think we still have to be careful because we are in this regime where, and I don't know if anybody has heard this before, uh, we're in this regime where much of it is still like alchemy. Uh, and again, remember, I think the important thing here, if you haven't heard it, this is a metaphor we've been running with for the past few months, there's nothing wrong with alchemy. Alchemy really worked. Alchemy worked really well and kind of for thousands of years, I mean, and it actually underlies still a lot of what we do in metal plating, it underlies a lot of what we do in glasswork, it underlies a lot of what we do in dyeing. It like was a foundation for, um, it was a foundation for a lot of our technological advancement. We did not understand the root causes. And because of that, we were held back. And once we started to figure out chemistry, there was an explosion, both in understanding and in reliability and actually in what we were able to do. And kind of that's, I think, really where we want to push is from this kind of thing where 
we have, uh, where, where we don't quite understand what happens into really something that is predictive and trustable. And so, I mean, all I mean here is that like, you know, this is in chemistry, but this is electromagnetism. You know, electromagnetism, if I have equations, those equations kind of predict some phenomena. Amazing, this is one of my favorite things in science of all time. Somebody comes up with some equations, those equations predict that waves should exist, and then you find out that waves exist. That's amazing. And right now we have something where it's like I have filters, and those filters lead me to think that that's the centipede and that's a peacock. And so we still have a ways to go, and this is kind of, I feel like, a, a critical kind of research thing that we all can push on. So let's go, let's end now with my friend Elon. So this is another stupid thing this guy said, which is that, you know, we we're going to have ultra-intelligent AI in two years, and it's going to make us into a pet. And I feel like, you know, I actually think he's, just like in that other quote about how AI is dangerous, I think there's an element of truth in the danger of AI. Because if we trust it too much, there are bad consequences. Same thing here. I actually think that in a lot of ways, we actually already are pets to AI. It's just really stupid. And it shows us, it shows us stuff to kind of feed our dopamine receptors, and we let it run rampant and feed conspiracy theories. And like us, machine learning researchers, we can fix that. But we have to engage and fix it. You know, it's on us now. Like, we have a moral obligation to make sure that it's not stupid, that it is trustable, and that it is going to be something that makes the world better and not worse. So I, I feel like we can do it. I think it's a challenge. And I think that's, like, that's why I feel like the next decade has to be. Okay, well, thank you for your time. Okay, wonderful talk, okay? I couldn't agree more, okay, about your methodological points and about the fears and probably there, there is a logic, okay, for these things, okay? So once the AI gets into this big corporation, there is another logic, okay, for the deployment of AI, for the bubble of AI and this and that, so that some people making money or, or whatever. So it's, it's not science driving, in some sense, these applications. So it's, that's the origin, but then, the, so if you need to get the people out of the uh, freeways so that the self-driving cars will be able to, to drive, okay, <laughs> eventually, okay, that's what's gonna happen, okay? So these, these are things that may happen. About the methodological point, I think that it's, it's great. So in a sense, so actually in AI, we had this story before in, 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 in the divisions so-called between scruffies and needs. In a sense, you have some tools and methods, okay? Some people focus on the simplest problems where these methods break. And some other people, in some sense, they try to see how far I can take these methods, like what is the most complicated things that I can do, okay? So this is, in some sense, that was the yes. distinction, okay, be, between... Uh, now, I, I just to defend, let's say, mainstream uh, uh, deep reinforcement learning and so on, <clears throat> in a sense. So the requirement that that you are posing, okay, to these people is that when you they have a method that works, okay, when you don't have the parameters of a, maybe a nonlinear model, and you say when you apply these to hidden linear models, okay, you don't get the same results of methods that have the built-in knowledge that you're dealing with a linear system. Right. So in a sense, that may be a bit too much. Right. Okay, in a sense, this is a general, gen actually the appeal of many of these methods yeah. that get so popular is because you apply them without understanding. It's not that they, are, they just right. build black box systems. They are black spot, black box use, okay? You don't need to understand the system. You just give it the inputs, the outputs, and you get something, right. okay? But of course, in systems where you know, in some sense, or the dynamics, okay, you can make linearity assumptions and so on. So there are different sources of, of knowledge that you're exploiting, okay? So, uh, so the idea that a genetic method, once that you instantiate them on a linear system, will give you as good results that the system has the building knowledge of de dealing with a linear system, Maybe it's a bit too much, okay? So be great, okay? But maybe too much. I don't know if. Mm -hmm. Right. No, I, I, I feel. I, I, okay. So two things. First of all, I do not think that people should not like only do stuff that if they have theory. I don't, that's ridiculous. I don't think that. Sorry if I actually came across that way. Uh, 
I do think that if you want to put it in things that involve actual people and it's not in the test lab, then I really would like some safety guarantees. So that's the big distinction. And I think we do have this current, there's a mentality. I'm from Berkeley. I'm very close to Silicon Valley. You know, the big company there, their, their, their whole idea was move fast and break things. Well, if there are people involved, you don't, why are we breaking things that involve people? That's not good. And that part, I, don't, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. I have friends. I have friends. Uh, I, I, I think it's dangerous. No, I think actually there are a lot of people in Silicon Valley who want that to change. I just think that that was something that, you know, it happens all the time. You have technology, it's awesome, you feel great about it, and then all of a sudden you realize that it has issues, right? <laughs> like everybody has their Oppenheimer moment in their own technological area as soon as something gets exciting. So I think it's, um, I think it's important for us to at least acknowledge it. You know, acknowledge that we have the issues and we ha that we have to fix. Now, I think that the, just to, the point about reinforcement learning with regards to model-free, model-based, one of the things that's a bit of an issue is that we say that we don't have to know anything about the system, but then we run millions and millions and millions of simulations, right? We show a plot. I showed a plot where I ran 100,000 uh, simulations. But in order to make that plot, I know that there are burning data centers at DeepMind, and there are 800 researchers running it. So we multiply 100,000 by several more orders of magnitude. And if I've been able to run the system several million times, I probably learned something about it. I didn't actually, I wasn't able to just get it to go from scratch. And I feel like that's the thing that we kind of like, I don't think we actually have general purpose methods that I put it on a robot and the robot walks in two minutes. And I'm worried that because there's so much reliance on simulators that are cheap, like I mean, man, Atari. Atari has 128 bytes of memory and no frame buffer. And the computers that we've used to actually solve Atari, like you use a billion times more computation to actually get one of these Atari demos to work than was in the stupid Atari. That's too much of a mismatch. Something weird is happening there. And I, I think that's the, that's what I want to understand. Is that, can we make that gap smaller? Andy. Thank you very much, guys. That's on. Okay. There we go. Thank <laughs> And uh, thank you very much for the talk. I also really enjoyed it. And I think this, this idea of models is really resonates well with, with things we've been thinking about. And I think it's not really clear now what the best way is to build models. And uh, uh, so I wanted to ask you something. I was curious when you said that we need new baselines. So I was just wondering what uh, if you have, I, I think you should have reasonable good intuition about what these baselines should, uh, right. should be like. So I think from the theory perspective, actually, I think LQR is still open. Like, we don't really know what lower bounds are for LQR that well. Ruginsky's lower bounds are very loose. Um, uh, I think that actually understanding the adaptive setting for LQR is still hard. Uh, Gergay was just apparently reviewing something, so we're making some progress in this space. I, I would like to actually get a better feel for that simple problem for continuous control. From there, yeah, now it becomes tricky. Now it becomes very tricky, because I don't know what to I, I like, as soon as you put out something that people can simulate quickly, it stops being a useful baseline from an experimental point of view. And I feel like the experimental community should really come, back, come together and think a little bit about how can we have something where we could really trust the results after the fact? And how can we have something where um, we can't overfit? So there's a, there, this is actually very interesting to me and I don't fully appreciate it yet. Supervised learning, those baselines, even though we like have been training on ImageNet for a really long time or MNIST or all these things, like those baselines actually are valuable 10, 20 years down the road. They, 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 they be maintain themselves as being difficult. And we've seen, and this is what's very cr uh, crazy to me, that oftentimes, even though it looks like, you're, like these models that are getting 0.4% error on MNIST, which seems like you've just completely overfit, they work on new digits better than the ones that get 1% error. And that's these little gaps. They actually do work. So something is happening there with supervised learning benchmarks. I worry that in reinforcement learning, what we're doing is training on the test set. And we haven't figured out the right way to establish a benchmark, which is not training on the test set. And that's what I'd, I'd, I would love to figure out how to do that. I think that would trans transform the field. I don't know how to do it yet, though. <laughs> so. Okay. Yeah, there yeah. we go. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's related to the, to, the, to the plot that you were showing about the Mujoko simulator. I mean, um, it was like astonishing. So you should 
that with random search you could beat TRPO. So there must can you maybe provide more details because Absolutely. we tried this type of random search and Absolutely. it doesn't work. So oh really? At least it doesn't give you so much reward than Wait, which other. Which I'm just gonna go back to find it. So this this yeah is the, like this, is this the table. Thing I, I mentioned beforehand this should be on archive either tomorrow. <laughs> Or on Monday. Okay, you reached the deadline, <laughs> the archive Monday. deadline. It's tomorrow or Monday. So yeah, we just we just finished this. So what do we actually to make the humanoid work? We had to do. We actually it's not just random search. I mean, it is almost just random search. The main thing we had to do was add an estimate for. We wanted to online estimate the uh, the first and second order uh, statistics of the state and transform those back to zero. So we tried to do a whitening operation to make the state look like zero mean, to make it look more like LQR. That was the only thing we changed, though. I can, I, and I can show you the paper afterwards. It's, 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 it's really like it's the, and if you want to implement it, it would be awesome to get double. To get, <laughs> I'll send you the draft. We have the parameters in the paper, too, so hopefully it should be reproducible. Thanks. <laughs> So if somebody else wants the mic, uh, we can pass it to you. Actually, this seems to be related, okay, to a similar results reported for the Atari games by the people doing genetic algorithms. Yeah, okay? yeah. So in I, the sense that they do also local search, yeah. okay, or what they call it, but, but they basically they get results that are similar to DQN, looks like. Yeah, I, have, I haven't gone into the details yet of the, I saw that paper, there was like, I think it was Frank Hutter's group just put this out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, first of all, I have an allergic reaction to genetic algorithms, but that's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. So I call it random search. This, uh, I think they're really but, the same. But genetic algorithms is the same idea. In a sense. I know. I think they're no, the no, same. No, no, in the sense that for any specific problem, <laughs> yeah. they're not going to be a good method. I mean, you yeah. can find, but in a sense, it's something you can use without understanding the problem. That's right. And this is the same thing here. This is kind of like this is first order black box random search. Um, the, the other thing, again, I want to overemphasize is that the controllers are linear controllers. If anybody, I don't know if we have any robotics folks here, but like, I, there's no way a linear controller can actually make a bipedal robot work. Mm -hmm. So what that really suggests is more that the simulators are broken. And actually, I know for a fact the reason why people love Mujoko is because it's fast, so I can run 100,000 iterations, and it's fast because it cheats on contact. And contact is actually really hard. That's what makes the whole thing difficult. And so. In some sense, it's like this is a little bit more about this benchmark not really telling us as much as we think it does than, than I think anything else here. There's one question behind you. Okay. I don't know, well, maybe people have to go. Yeah, okay, so I'll, so I'll pass it on in a second. I, I'm just, while I'm walking there, uh, so I'm going to say that the, what you do here is, is really not all that idiotic. So, so this, is, this is not just random search. This, this is very closely related to Thompson sampling. The way that you're perturbing the parameters and you're doing the gradient step towards uh, the updated oh. parameters, but uh, we'll talk about it later. OK. <laughs> it's well, actually I mean, something principal. No, 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 to, like to be fair, principal. sorry. And this yeah. is another thing. Please, please have uh, the mic over. But random search, I mean something very specific when I say random search. Random search is a class. It's an algorithm from the 60s. It means pick a direction uniformly at random and try that direction. That's what random search means. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean uniform random guessing. It really does mean take your current thing, find a perturbation uniformly at random and try that perturbation. That's, that's, that's what I meant by random search. OK, yeah. cool. Okay. Right. Uh, regarding your comment uh, at the uh -huh. end, uh, towards the end, uh, that what kind of uh, experiments or how you can test the things work. Uh, so one thing that we computer scientists and see many people in this area, engineers many times in, in academia, talk about experiments. And I had worked with. Uh, Scientists that are work in areas that are more uh, uh, related to, yeah, so more empirical. And they always laugh when I say that these are my experiments, because these are simulations. They are not experiments. That's yeah. right. <laughs> and usually the reason is that. The reason is that experiments, for example, in medical science, is a clinical trial, where you have to go really, really with and test your, your system in a real environment, because otherwise it doesn't pass. Yeah. But one thing that is also interesting that I guess I don't know why happens like that in, in, in medical science uh, is more difficult to approve drugs than to approve, approve equipment that is going to go into your body. And well, right now there is a little bit of uh, news regarding this direction, 
And I don't know is, uh, why that's the case, but it's easy to get approved of, let's say, prothesis than to get approved of a drug. There are more, the, the clinical trial are more, m more difficult. And I don't know, how, when, when we have a car, I think we have to have clinical trials yeah. of our car. So otherwise, it's true, you, what you're saying is, uh, and maybe is part of the community to push in that direction. What is the meaning of letting something out yeah. into the field? as yeah. opposed to testing in the, yeah. in the lab. I think, I think a great example of something that's hard, it's much easier to do a car to get a, the autonomous systems thing is very weird. Like those, those, they just, this was another example of Silicon Valley hubris. Tesla just put it out, called it autopilot and didn't have any regulation. That's nuts. But I was gonna say that airplanes versus cars is actually very interesting. Right. Point counterpoint, right? Airplanes, the amount of testing that has to go into actually getting a new airplane shipped is crazy. Yeah, yeah, there has a lot of stuff. And then you look at the number of airplane deaths versus the number of car deaths. And <laughs> so there's a safety trade off. So, yeah, it's really all about kind of how, how we want to mitigate the, those risks. It's still, it is astonishing to me that we let people drive. <laughs> it's, it really, like, it's really dangerous. And we just, uh, anyway, this is something, you know, it's a risk everybody's willing to take. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know. <laughs> I guess then it's time to thank Ben again. Thank you.